Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks on this wonderful Thursday morning. We're glad that you tuned in to listen about cooperatives and the benefits of cooperatives. You know, I want to tell you uh, just right off the bat that they're the plaque uh, that I saw at Greenbelt Homes. and it's a, it's, Greenbelt is a housing co-op in Greenbelt, Maryland. And that plaque read, co-ops gives people the tools to control their destiny. And that those tools are mainly in education, but we have today in the studio with us today, Doug O'Brien, who's with the White House, and he's on the Rural Council at the White House. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Vernon. Good, great to be here. Great to have you here. You know, he's got a great big smile on this morning, even though his four-year-old kept him up most of the night. <laughs> Tell us what are the benefits of co-ops and how important it is to the U.S. economy. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I actually have a uh, kind of a long history with co-ops. I grew up in a farm in Iowa, and folks in rural places understand how important the cooperative movement has been to the development of uh, rural America, uh, small towns and farmers. I mean, just right off the bat, a couple data points. Cooperatives for farmers have been just a key strategy over the decades, uh, 100-plus years, uh, nearly right at 100 years. And, for instance, it, you know, what farmer cooperatives do is it allows farmers to come together and market their products. And last year, approximately those sales amounted to $250 billion. That's with a B, Vernon. Uh, so it would be $250 billion of sales from farmers, from cooperative. farmer cooperatives. And a lot of that is a, a lot of the dairy that, uh, you know, the healthy milk and cheese that, that we're able to, to drink and eat, uh, much of that, if not the majority of it comes through, uh, the cooperative chain. So much of the grain that's marketed, uh, comes through farmer cooperatives, uh, more and more. The interest in local and regional food systems, uh, you know, the uh, the food that finds its way to not only your farmer's market, but um, but to your grocery store or to your local uh, food co-op, that's marketed through uh, a farmer cooperative. So nearly 2 million farmers are part of cooperatives and market their products through cooperatives. And, and it's, a, it's a major force. And, you know, we'll talk in a little bit. It's not only farm cooperatives, but so much of the basic, really, infrastructure and services in rural places uh, are there because of cooperatives. So you've got 2 million farmers that sell about $250 billion of sales a year through cooperatives. That's right. That's right. And they're called marketing cooperatives. Yeah, those are marketing cooperatives. Uh, primarily, uh, you know, the real basic model is uh, a number of farmers and some of the bigger cooperatives uh, – that number can be well into the thousands, will come together to sell their corn, their soybeans, their wheat, uh, and they'll, they'll come together to sell that so that they have, uh, they have the scale to be sophisticated in what are now very complicated markets, number one. Number two, they have the scale to have uh, the market power, and that's really when you look at the, the foundational uh, legislation statutes on cooperatives, one of the main reasons is so that small business entities, in this case farmers, uh, can come together and, and really compete in the market. And, uh, and it's, it's a huge success over the decades and, as I said, uh, essentially a century that farmers have seen with farmer cooperatives. It's fascinating um, that co-ops have done so much. But let me Stop a minute and tell people what a co-op is. If you've been listening, you are, you've heard me say this over and over again, but I want you to understand a co-op is any business you can think of. We're talking about mm -hmm. farmers right now. We're talking about it could be a, uh, a food co-op. It could be a housing co-op. 
any business you can think of can be a food co-op. If the business, it depends on how it's owned and controlled. If it's owned and controlled by the workers, by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. Mm -hmm. And some of your food co-ops, your markets, could be a worker co-op, or it could be the other one. This is the one where if it's owned by the consumers, those people that use their products and services. So you can have a food co-op that's owned by everyday people to go in there and shop. They own it, and then they control it. They will hire they, the people that own it, elect the board of directors, and the board of directors control the business. Mm -hmm. And that's just the control part. So you get ownership and control you can have a worker co-op, a consumer co-op. Then you can get people, different businesses to come in together and form a marketing co-op where they, they sell their products together. Artists do, does this. Farmers do this. You can, any group of businesses come together. And when, you, when they do that, just like Doug had just said, they have a, lo a lot more control over their products, with the pricing they get the distribution system and all of that. They don't all have to do it together. They can hire management to help them to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's another one, and that's the purchasing co-op. Uh, and that's farmers do this also. Absolutely. Yeah. They will come together and they will buy their grain or their, their seeds. Yep. Seeds are so important, mm -hmm. healthy seeds. Or they will buy their gasoline. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases, they may pull together and buy a tractor mm -hmm. that they couldn't individually do. And then they share that tractor. They share right. their resources. Yeah. So you get all of these people working together, and this is why I've come to love co-ops. Yeah. But I didn't find out about co-ops until about 20 years ago, and I'm 68 now. Right, right. So I was 48 before I found anything about co-ops. Right. How did you learn about co-ops? You know, if you are uh, if you grew up in a farm, particularly in uh, in Iowa or the northern part, uh, north central United States, uh, you learn about co-ops. It's sort of in your blood. The, we were part of a co-op that, uh, you know, we were able to source some of the inputs that we needed on our farm. We were a, I grew up in a hog farm. So you're talking about inputs, corn. you're talking about the seed and Seeds the fertilizer. Seeds and fertilizer and gasoline and diesel. And uh, and we also marketed some of our products through a cooperative, uh, some of the things that, that we grew on the farm. Also, uh, our telephone service was uh, supplied by, you know, we were part of a cooperative for our telephone service. We were mm -hmm. part of a cooperative for our electric uh, supply. And in fact, most of rural America is serviced by rural electric cooperatives. There's such a, a storied history on the development of rural parts of America and really co-ops are, are right at the heart of that. It was, it was part of the, uh, in the 30s, of, of pushing out economic opportunity to places that were, you know, harder to build that infrastructure, didn't have as many people that lived there, but still those people deserve to have that quality of life that you talked mm -hmm. about right at the top of the show, and cooperatives made that happen. You talked about ownership and control, right. and those are two. And the other thing is benefits, right? So the way cooperatives and marketing cooperatives in particular, uh, if there's profit at the end of the day, well, that patronage, you know, it's called dividend in, in other ways, but in, in uh cooperative world, that patronage goes right back to the people who are members of that cooperative. And what I like about the control aspect of it is that the members, sometimes through the board of directors, but the members decide how much of that profit or surplus, whatever you want to call it, how much of that will be kept in the business to grow the business and how much of it will be given out to the owners, right. which are either the workers or the consumers. That's right. Okay. That's right. So it's a fascinating way of both learning how to run a business and building wealth, mm -hmm. income and wealth. Again, that's why I love co-ops. I'm an African-American, and most people may know that. Doug can see it. <laughs> and I never believed, even as a kid, that anybody would give me 40 acres and a mule. Mm -hmm. That story that they, after the Civil War, we were African-Americans were going to be given 40 acres and a mule. And I also didn't, how you, how you sort of um, take wealth and disperse it, make it so that everybody can get a piece of America dream, mm -hmm. this wealth creation. I never believed that wealthy people, most of which are male, white men, mm -hmm. I didn't believe that wealthy people would give money to people that don't have. As a matter of fact, they believe that most of the reason that people that don't have is because they won't work. And I, I've lived in community. I know that's just not true. So, but, so I don't believe anybody would give. But this, this co-op model is a way of getting everyday people to learn how to run a business and then work in that business and if there's a profit, they give it. Yeah. 
they get it. Yeah, and I think that's such a great point. Now, talk a, a little bit about the work that I get to do at the White House. And I'm, as you mentioned, I, I work in the uh, at the White House Domestic Policy Council, and I help uh, the chair of the Rural Council, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. One of the things I do is basically help drive the agenda for the Rural Council. Rural Council is uh, is a body within the White House of all the cabinet members that do work in rural places, and that's essentially all the cabinet members except maybe the State Department. And one of the things that we've done and really focused on in this last six or seven months is focusing on rural child poverty. And that is so consistent with what President Obama has been working on in the last six and a half years. And I, I joined the administration right at the beginning, you know, what's called the Ladders of Opportunity Agenda. And this goes right back to your point, Vernon. It's about uh, making sure that people have the tools to be successful. And the investments that, uh, you know, the administration has made not only in rural America, but but certainly in urban America, too, uh, increased investments in early childhood uh, education, increased investments in uh, basic infrastructure, uh, making sure that people have access to community college. You know, certainly the president has proposed and continues to advocate for for an expansion of these. And it's it's really all about making sure that people have opportunity to succeed and climb that ladder. And co-ops are such a great tool uh, for that to happen. You know, co-ops to me is the only vehicle I have seen that can help that go. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't see any in, in America with the individualism of, of John Wayne or the Lone Ranger, which I grew up with, mm -hmm. that they're rugged individualists and they do it by themselves. And if you go back and look at those movies, they didn't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. There was always people around that, that helped them mm -hmm. do it. They may have been the leader in a hierarchy society. And in, in, in this hierarchy of the uh, leader and coming down, you can still have a co-op. Mm -hmm. But the people at the bottom are the ones, the workers, are the ones that say how this co-op will function and what the policies are. And, again, that's why I love it. I want to go back to the president and the White House. Does the president know about co-ops? He does. Yeah. You know, he's, of course, President Obama, before he before he came into the White House, was a senator from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I can tell you, I, I, I took some time in 2008 in Ohio to be part of the general campaign and learned how much he knew about rural America. We're going to come back and talk about uh, President Obama. We're going to take a break right now. If you have any questions of myself or Doug or any comments, please call in at 1-800-450-7876. We're going to take a break to get the weather and the news and the traffic, and then we'll be right back to talk about cooperatives and President Obama's knowledge of them. News updates on the web at woldcnews.com. Welcome back, everybody. You know, this is Vernon Oaks on uh, Everything Cooperative. We're talking to Doug O'Brien from the White House Rural Council. And we're talking about co-ops, and the National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program. Uh, NCB's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis, let me hear, special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged, whether that's rural America or urban America, whether it's the cities or the farm towns. This is NCB's mission, and they do an excellent job of it. Uh, if you want to know about NCB, go on, go online and look at ncb.coop. Their webpage is ncb.coop. When we took a break, we were talking uh, to Doug about his what's going on in the White House, about rural, the Rural American Council, and I had asked him about uh, President Obama's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, just it, that. The, the reason I'm asking you is because he was a community developer in Chicago, uh, in Illinois, as a senator, He's a community, came out of community developer, and we've been on this program over over a year and a half now, and everybody comes on and talks about a co-op creates community, first and foremost. A co-op is created to solve some community problem. Mm -hmm. One guy from Senegal said, Papa Sin said, that if there's no community problem, there's no need for a co-op. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went as far as it, to put that on it. So I would think that President Obama would know about co-ops, and I've been trying to see if we could reach out to him to 
to see if he could create help create more le more legislation to help it easier for worker co-ops and consumer co-ops work and function in all of the states. Sure. Well, I think that, you know, in terms of the president's knowledge of cooperatives, I think we just need to think about two things in his biography. One, as you mentioned, his his uh, his years as a community organizer in Chicago. We know that the housing cooperative, uh, you know, are, are strong in that city. Certainly he he knew and and, uh, and you know worked with the cooperatives, the housing cooperatives there in Chicago. And the other way, and one that I might be more familiar with, is that he was a senator from the state of Illinois and represented that whole state of Illinois. I know for a fact he spent significant time in downstate with rural communities, with agriculture. I had a chance when I worked on, on the campaign for President Obama to spend time with his colleagues, his ag and rural colleagues, who talked about you know the the time he spent and the work that he did on behalf of farmers and rural communities. So, so he certainly knows about cooperatives, you know, and and President Obama certainly knows about and is I I argue that there's no stronger advocate for empowering people to control their own destiny, uh, and that's all about again the ladders of opportunity about giving people the tools to be successful. Cooperatives are such a fag magnificent tool for people to come together and kind of solve that community problem. A lot of times it's going to be about income or, uh, you know, market power in the mm -hmm. farmer world. might be about housing, might be about, uh, you know, child care, whatever the, whatever the community need is. And, you know, that uh, job creation, getting income is always in the African-American community. African-Americans, the, the unemployment rate is twice as much. Right as it is for white America. And, mm -hmm. and the, uh, Latino, it's uh, 20%, 30% higher than white America. But African-American world, unemployment. But that also does not include, which is one of the things I always found interesting in the definition of unemployment, it doesn't include those brothers that hang around on the, on the street corner and not looking for work That's because right. you have to be looking for work to be counted. Right. But once somebody feels like, well, what's the use? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a felon, I don't have the education, I've just lost the last job or so, then they don't go looking. Right. And um, that turns out, when they don't look, that turns out to be the biggest barrier mm -hmm. to to getting up and, and like, like you said, the ladders of opportunity. Mm -hmm. There are no opportunities when that happens. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing about co-ops is you can come together. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a felon or whether you got bad credit or whatever. You come together with a group of people that have the same goals, and as long as you work together and have integrity, what I have found in managing co-ops, for the people out there that don't know, I, I manage housing co-ops. That's what I do in my day job. Mm -hmm. So w what I have found out, it takes in knowledge and integrity for a, a co-op to work. Mm -hmm. And knowledge and integrity is more important than the knowledge. I've got a 16-unit senior co-op. They, uh. they don't have a whole lot of knowledge about how to run a business, but they have mother wit or common sense, uh -huh. and they are able to get, get the knowledge, and they also hold each other highly accountable. Uh -huh. So that, that that integrity is there. So um, I like co-ops. Tell me a, a little bit more about what you all do in a rural council, the yeah, White House Rural Council. Sure. So the, the White House Rural Council, it's, it's designed to make sure that the federal government is working Together, all those different agencies, the Department of Agriculture, the Housing Urban Development, Department of Commerce, on and on, that that those agencies are working together in a way that we're making the most positive impact in rural places. And, and what that means for the Obama administration is determining what those local communities want, their own grassroots strategies, and figuring out how can the federal government support those strategies. It's, some people call that place-based policy. Some people call it community economic development. And a lot of times, you know, that tool that's going to be most effective for those communities uh, is indeed co-ops. The, the focus and the priority of the White House Rural Council these days is on rural child poverty. And we talked about, you know, some of the different demographics and poverty uh, you alluded to before, Vernon. This is an interesting statistic, a couple statistics. There's Persistent poverty counties are those counties that have had at least 20% uh, poverty rate for the last 30 years. And 85% uh, of all the persistent poverty counties are in rural America. And now here's one more level on that. The majority of those counties have what's called a majority minority population. So that is to say, the majority of the, you know, most of the persistent poverty counties 
uh, are are basically minority counties, you know, either in in the Delta, uh, uh, African American, and then the Southwest border, uh, Hispanic, and uh, in Indian country is the other concentration. And then the other concentration of persistent poverty counties is actually in in Appalachia. Uh, but um, but I think it's it's important for people like me and a lot of others who do poverty work to understand that. You know, it's it's a complicated story, and uh, it's a complicated story, but there's one uh, theme that no matter, I think, where it is, urban or rural, uh, you know, what types of communities you're working with, the most important thing is to make sure that people have the tools to be successful. And, again, cooperatives are, are such an important tool. Uh, for communities and people to come together to improve their lives. Doug, you just said a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to try to break it down a little bit to make sure I understand it and the people out there understand it. You said that th these communities that have high poverty, where there's been 20% poverty rate for the last 30 years, 20% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of what? What is that? 20%? Oh, so that's, that's to say that at least 20% of the population of that county has lived under the poverty rate. Okay. Yeah. 20% of the population is under, and, and so what's the poverty rate? Uh, that changes every year, but right now the poverty, the official poverty rate uh, for a family of four is, I think, right at about $23,000. Okay, so if you get 20% of the population at, in today's rate is under 20, make under $23,000 a yeah. year, mm -hmm. then then that that is considered... A poverty community. Yeah. A community of poverty. That's right. That's a family living in poverty, a family of four. Yeah. And then 80% of these populations, these counties, are in rural America. That's right. 85% of the counties. 85%. Yeah. 85% of, of those persistent poverty counties are, are rural counties. Okay. When we talk about urban areas, mm -hmm. if you go into what used, Shaw used to be in D.C., used to be poverty area or... Southeast D.C., mm -hmm. um, maybe somewhere in, in Baltimore, there's right. an area that's poverty. Yeah. Uh, South Central L.A. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, are these the other 15 percent? So some of the counties would be the other 15 percent. And this is getting, you know, into yeah. numbers. But part of it is that in a in an urban county, yeah, the the very poor places can get, if you will, kind of washed out by some of the very you know, wealthy places. Okay. And and the point that I think that, you know, some of those stats that I just talked about is that in rural it can be widespread. You know, it's not it's not necessarily just a neighborhood, but most of the county. Um now, you know, an important piece we have to say when you're talking about urban and rural is the number of people. Uh can really, you know, a, a rural county can yep. have yep. one percent of what a big urban county can have. So that's an important factor. The other the other thing is that eighty you said that the majority of these 85% counties mm -hmm. are minority. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I was talking about uh, NCB's uh, mission is to work in economically challenged communities. That would be these 85% and which are majority of them are minority. That's right. And the, the reason I point that out is I think a lot of people think, if they think about it at all, that urban poverty is a minority issue, rural poverty is a you know as a non as a white issue and that's just not the case it's it's more complicated than that okay we have to take another break if you have any questions or comments you can call in at 1-800-450-7876 we'll be back with doug talking about uh, cooperatives the benefits of cooperatives and what the white house is doing to help minority or help rural communities which it turns out in poverty is mostly a majority of these communities are minority with $250 billion of sales going through farmer cooperatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll talk about some of the other co-ops when we come back. If you have any questions, call 1-800-450-7876. We'll be right back. News updates on the web at woldcnews.com. Hi again, this is Vernon Oaks on Everything Cooperative. You know, WOL's policy, their motto is information is power. And this is why the National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program, to bring you information so you would have power. Now, you only get that power if you go into action. 
as one of our guests talked about here, is you have to do something in order to get the power. And doing something may be getting on the line at ncb.coop or going to NCBA, the National Cooperative Business Association dot co-op, and look at development of co-ops, or you can call in like Amar has done. Hi, Amar. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, yes. I want to thank you for this program, and uh, I'm very happy your guest is here. What is your uh, guest name and official uh, title with the White House? I'm Doug O'Brien, and I am uh, a senior policy advisor for the White House Domestic Policy Council, and I work on on the uh, the rural issues. Okay. Well, I want to ask uh, a few quick questions. One is, what is the President Obama's, the White House, and your position on uh, reparations? I heard the issue was brought up 40 acres and a mule, mm-hmm. and there are a few other uh, quick questions I want to uh, ask relating to that. Sure. Uh, Mark, I just need you to make them quick. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that, you know, going back to this, this theme of making sure that people – uh, have the tools to be successful economically. And to the direct question on reparations, it's one that I'm actually not in a position. I could, I'll come back if I can get your offline, I can get your contact information. But, but that idea of, of investing in things that uh, make sure that people uh, can be successful, and in particular people who are on the, you know, the lower rungs of the economic ladder right now so they can climb into uh, into the middle class, uh, things like education and housing, and uh, in making sure that people can come together and have the the power, the uh, the economic power, to market their products um, and to to gain the skills to be successful. So that's uh, you know that's a priority. You can see it in the president's budgets. We're talking a lot about appropriations right now, um, and this is that's the White House position. Well, let me ask. What programs are available for those who see um, that America has failed the descendants of slaves and the descendants who were here before Christopher Columbus, the conquistadors and others? What assurance uh, do, with the, um, do you and the White House offer that we would actually receive justice? Amar, that's not so much a co-op question, but here's where it fits in for me. This is Vernon talking now. For me... As an African-American, a descendant from slaves, and I go back to the 1850s in my family where we were slaves, and my mother's side, my grandfather's side, the slave owner in Virginia. So, yeah, we're descendants of slaves, but I, I have no sense that anybody's going to hand me or give me anything except for maybe knowledge. So knowledge is the one that I think we have to go get, and then we have to pull ourselves up, in my sense. And this is why this co-op is so important to me, is because this is a vehicle by which we can pull ourselves up. The capitalistic model doesn't do it for us, okay? So this co-op model does. So it's like, how can you get together with a group of people if there's something in your community that you need to happen? I'm meeting with some people in Baltimore. They're looking at food co-ops and housing co-ops this afternoon. So how can we create different businesses that help us so that we can create the welfare within our communities and not look for or need a handout from somebody? But I'm looking for President Obama to give us a hand up. I know you want to move on, but I just want to say this, that um, those of us, we look at it as nations that are suffered and aggrieved. And and I know this goes, be in a sense, beyond the co-op, but it, it addressed the issue of land and territory and the loss of land and territory. So before you had the Homestead Act and others, we, we, there were large amounts of land. And today, my understanding, Ted Turner and others hold more land than I've heard. Baby, uh, Amar, I'm going to have to cut you off because you're going way away from our subject matter on co-ops. I've tried to pull it together for you of – whether Ted Turner has land, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in the South, the, the black farm owners, the smaller ones, they had the most concentrated land. Uh, Ralph Page has been on. Um, he has re- retired. And uh, Cornelius Blandy will be on in a couple, talking about how we keep the land that the blacks own. There's been a lot that's been taken away. So I understand what you're saying, but we've got to do it ourselves. That, that's my only conclusion. I, I, the Ted Turners of the world, definitely not the Donald Trumps of the world, are going to hand out and give us anything. Those people that are billionaires, they're not going to give it. So how do we get our own? That's my view, and this is what my principle is. I'm not looking to get anything, any handout from the government. If, if I might, and you mentioned the Federation for Southern Cooperatives, and they're, 
you know, an organization that's been there uh, uh, based out of Atlanta, working in the southeast with small farmers, minority farmers for uh, four decades. And something that the federal government has done when I was I was at USD at the Department of Agriculture before I came over uh, to the White House, we've partnered with the Federation and with groups like that for capacity building, essentially. And it's it's giving that organization the ability to share knowledge, to give those small farmers the tools to be uh, successful in their business. And, and mostly, particularly with the Federation working in the cooperative model, you know, they've, they've done some fantastic work uh, in the Southeast working with uh, with small farmers in that part of the world. And, uh, and it's not only them, but we see cooperatives as sort of the core group working with small farmers, small retailers, uh, minority, and otherwise uh, across the country. You know, like I said to you, I'm, I've been in housing co-ops, and at Greenbelt, they have a, a daycare center where the parents are in the co-op. It's a consumer co-op. Mm-hmm. And so what I like about co-ops, Amar, I hope you're still listening to us. What I like about co-ops is no matter what the need is in the community, you can come together and create it. The, the uh, Federation of Southern Co-ops, as Doug was explaining, and, and the folks that have been on the program have talked about, is that too often people of power, and too often that's been white men, would come in and take land from people that did, had let little power. So banding together in community gives people power, not only power from helping each other, but political power so that they can keep their 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 land uh get the tools that they need to to have better crops uh when papa sin was on from senegal he said that one farmer said that the reason he liked being in a co-op was because he now had a he could feed his family for the year before he didn't he couldn't su- even survive with on his small farm but being in a co-op, he was getting the right kinds of seeds, getting the right kind of fertilizer, in a lot of cases becoming organic farmers to get a better price. Then they made enough money. Not only could he feed his family for the whole year, but he could also build wealth. He had some savings left over at the end of the year. So I think that's the way we're going to have to do this, Omar. I think we're going to have to come together and pull ourselves up, working with President Obama and the Rural Council, and other entities of, of what we can, how we can get funding or how we can get the knowledge to create these businesses and, and create wealth, income and wealth. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything? Else yeah, no, the, and I think that's, those are great points. And, and actually, I'd, I just, I'd point out that um, for, for farmers in particular, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, has programs to support cooperative development, farmer cooperative development. Uh, it has programs to support socially disadvantaged farmers. And it has programs to help farmers borrow dollars so they can so they can purchase a farm. They have a farm ownership loans that are uh, subsidized with a little bit lower interest rate, so that small and beginning farmers and almost all of those loans now go to small and beginning farmers, so farmers can can purchase the land, which is really the critical asset. Uh, and of course, again, the Federation for Southern Cooperative, you know, one of its core missions is maintaining ownership in the land, you know, and when you're talking about rural America and empowerment, land is is a critical asset uh, for people to to be able to have. Okay, I've been thinking about getting a farm, so now I'm going to go to see if I get one of these loans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to go now to local and regional food systems. Mm-hmm. We've talked about food co-ops. Uh, what do you mean when you talk about a food system? Yeah, so... Um, you know, the food system, and I guess the, in its easiest uh, definition, it's just that, that system that gets food from the field to your plate, farm to fork, some people say. Mm. And more and more people are interested on kind of where that food started and, you know, how it was processed, where it was distributed and, and how it got to them on the plate. And they're interested in who's participating in that food system. The, the example is, you know, one one example, maybe the simplest example is people like to go to a farmer's market and talk to the farmer and ask that farmer, you know, how did you grow these beets? Tell me about this. And, and those farmers can tell them, you know, a, about the production, whether it was organic or whether they used this type of, of fertilizer or that. And that, that family 
that mom who's buying food for her for her kids can make a decision and she can really trust that information. You know that the food system in the United States is uh, it is abundant. The dollars that people spend on food relative to other places in the in the world is is essentially the lowest, which means we have more dollars to pay for education. We have more dollars. Uh, to pay for other critical things for our family. So, you know, it's a great food system. But I think there's great opportunity for consumers and farmers and those in between of, of taking advantage of, um, of really empowering people. And local and regional food systems can do that because it's, it's kind of in that same vein of cooperatives that people might want to uh, spend more of their dollars locally or spend it uh, on organizations that they have confidence that the uh, – you know, that the dollars are lifting up the people who are doing the work in that food system. Uh, and a lot of times that's going to mean a cooperative. So there was, we, did, we put out some numbers, uh, USDA put out some numbers last week that uh, was looking at some, actually some external folks who were saying that local and regional food system uh, market is growing to $11 billion a year now. And it continues to be one of the fastest growing areas uh, in agriculture. So this is the farmers markets and so forth. Farmers markets. And then, you know, beyond that, the institutions like colleges or hospitals that are sourcing more and more of their food from, you know, from their community or from their region. And that's something USDA has worked a lot on in the last six years is a a program called Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, which you can just uh, look that up on the internet and you'll see some great maps some great data, some great examples of how, uh, of how people can come together and and uh, and learn more about their food system, and and grow opportunity for people in their community. That re- that reminds me of uh, the Evergreen uh, Cooperative in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. They have a they have three different co-ops, but they're they are partner with the hospitals and the universities in right. Cleveland. Uh, and one of those is the Green City Growers, and they they grow foods for these for. Uh, Fresh foods for for these institutions, yeah. Uh, and I think there's 40 people in the uh, laundry cooperative, and about 40 in the energy cooperative, and another 40 in the in the growers. So about they've created 120 jobs uh-huh. in inner city Cleveland, and one of these I would call it a poverty neighborhood. Uh-huh. Thinking of Cleveland, so um, I can see how this works. It's, I, I like this uh, from the farm to the fork. Mm-hmm. Okay, just real quick, we have to take another break. But DC now has if you're a senior. You can go to these markets mm-hmm. and get ten dollars a mm-hmm. coupon for ten bucks and, mm-hmm. and buy these foods, which I think I haven't tried. I'm a senior, but I haven't tried that yet. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways that government is trying to help people get better foods mm-hmm. on their plates. Mm-hmm. We're going to take another break. Uh, this is Vernon Oaks. We're going into our last segment here. The, the hour goes by very fast, Doug, mm-hmm. and we'll be right back to talk to Doug O'Brien about what is going on at the White House, Rural Council, and um, what else is happening in co-ops. He grew up on the farm in Iowa, and he loves co-ops. Has a great big smile on this morning, even though he was up to 4 o'clock. We'll be right back. (laughs) 1450 WOL. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks talking to you about cooperatives. National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program. You know, NCB's customers are cooperatives, such as grocery wholesale co-ops, purchasing co-ops, or housing co-ops. And any other customers that share in the spirit of cooperation driven by democratic organizing principles. They may be Alaskan or Native American enterprise, which by their very nature are member-run and member-owned. Others might be community health centers or charter schools driven entirely by community need. What they all have in common is a single fundamental principle that they have joined together cooperatively to meet personal, social, and our business needs. And this is what we already talked about, why co-ops are so, so fundamentally important for any community. And Doug O'Brien is our guest today in the studio talking to us about rural, the rural council, the White House rural council. Um, Doug, We've talked about the benefits, particularly with farmers in rural America, but do you see how it works for Co-ops work for urban? Oh, absolutely. And picking up kind of where we left before the break, you know, more and more as people are interested in where their food comes from, um, we see cooperatives and in particular food co-ops 
as a growing opportunity and uh, in answering that community need that uh, that people are calling for. Just last year, my mom, who turned 80, is going to turn 81 in a, about a month. Fantastic. Uh, she, uh, she joined a co-op in Dubuque, Iowa, which for, if you're in Iowa, is urban, a town <laughs> of about 60,000 people. Uh, and, um, you know, I've certainly been members of food co-ops uh, in different places I've lived, and, and there's some great ones here in the Washington, D.C. area. So you have those food co-ops that happen obviously in urban places. And we actually see more and more, you mentioned Cleveland, uh, the urban agriculture, people using uh, either old or new technologies to grow food uh, in the urban center. There's uh, Detroit in particular, some place that people point to. There's a lot of green space in Detroit and utilizing those vacant lots to grow food for people in Detroit. We've seen it in Cleveland. We see it uh, well, we see it in the community gardens around here in Washington, D.C. But mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, cooperatives have that application around food, not only in rural places, but also in urban. And, and of course, cooperatives are so critical uh, in urban places around, you know, you mentioned child care, certainly housing thing you're an expert on. So, yeah, uh, they're, they're all over and they're important every place. Any business you can think of could be a cooperative. Mm-hmm. Any any need that your community have, if you get three, four, five people together, you can form a cooperative owned by the employees uh, who would be the employees and the workers. So we've had several people on talking about worker cooperatives, and we'll have more. Matter of fact, this weekend I'm going up to Massachusetts to a worker cooperative convention, which would be my first there. And one of the things we normally talk about the principles, uh, but the, the fifth principle is my my most the favorite mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. and that is um, education, training, and information. Yeah. So that's what will happen this week, and a lot is how you start a worker cooperative. Um, that's a U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. <clears throat> so, getting this knowledge out in every every cooperative. Uh, workshop or conference that I've gone to, you find that information is shared so easily. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've taught for 12 years too, Doug, and so I found out that when people, particularly adults, but I think it's anybody, when they know how to, they can use the information, when they can use that information right away, then they learn it much quicker. They become a sponge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When, it, when you're in a classroom in college and you're going, what, do I really need this? Mm-hmm. Then it, it's harder for you to get it and grab it and, and, and uh, keep it. But when people are getting that information, and I call it just-in-time knowledge, yeah. just-in-time information, yeah. you need to learn the financial statements so you can make informed decisions about your business. Uh-huh. People learn it. That's I don't right. care how afraid they are of math. Or and that, that is, and you talked about the cooperative, the seven cooperative principles. The fifth is your favorite. The seventh might be mine, which is the concern for community. But uh, but that, that fifth of education, training, and information, it's so core to the business model of cooperatives. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it goes back to that theme of, of empowerment, of uh, making sure that people have the tools to control their own destiny. And a lot of times the best way to get that done is when people come together and work together. And when you're in a cooperative, you know that the members, the people that are part of that cooperative have that common mission. So I think there's that level of of sort of understanding and trust towards that common mission, whether that's to, you know, fix whatever that community challenge is, that that's what you're all after. So I, I agree. It's, um, it's been, you know, the cooperative movement has been so important in rural America, uh, the rural electric cooperatives, uh, so much of the infrastructure and telecommunications and water and in housing also, uh, have happened because of cooperatives and, and um, and we see that uh, all over American urban and rural places. What this all leads to me is corps is so fundamentally great for the people. We the people, people own, people control. I often ask the question uh, to myself: Is why aren't there more? Why you know? I had somebody from the U.S. Federation. He said there are four hundred worker cooperatives. U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. There are 400 cooperatives out of all of the different businesses in the U.S. There's only about 400 Mm -hmm. and 150 of them in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because of the growth, and 40% of the people that are in forming these worker co-ops are people of color. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting to me because Mm -hmm. so few. It's like, why? And the same thing for housing co-ops. HUD gives most of their money to apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. And I get most of the apartment buildings are owned by people that have money. Okay, and there's no wealth building for the people in the apartments, 
There's no knowledge being transferred for the people in the apartment. Mm-hmm. But when co when HUD did did give money to co-ops, a lot of those co-ops are still at, still in existence today. Mm-hmm. And people create wealth and they create knowledge. Mm-hmm. Not only do I've had some of them on a program that says not only what they learn to run the business, but they also use that same information to run their life. Mm-hmm. Budgeting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Right. You know, you th- I think that's such a great question. I've asked myself the same question is, is uh, you know, given the huge individual and community benefits from cooperatives, why aren't there more? You know, I think of kind of two things. One is some people don't know about them, think, you know. Thankfully, we have this show and, and a lot of other efforts from, from NCB and others uh, to make sure that people understand that the model exists and, and the benefits of the model. I think part of it is actually being part of a co-op. You do – there is some – you need to put some, some of your personal skin in the game. And depending on the cooperative, it might mean you put some money into the game. But if it's a marketing cooperative, it means that you do need to participate. And, uh, you know, that's what makes cooperatives work. And some other business models, whether it's a C-Corp or something like that, you really barely have to participate in that business. But, you know, you, you do need to participate for it to be successful. I, I actually think that people, younger people, younger than me, people uh, in their 20s who are uh, really interested um, in controlling or being part of community solutions – in what they think might be non-traditional ways, I think that there's an answer there for them uh, to the question of how, you know, what's the best way that we can do that? And that answer has been around for 100 years, and that's a cooperative. And, uh, you know, I think the moment is right for for real growth and resurgence of cooperatives. They're strong uh, right now in particular sectors, and I think in particular farmer cooperatives, they're they're particularly strong. But uh, But now is the time for people who, who really want to, you know, be empowered, uh, and in particular, people who are from, uh, you know, are relatively economically disenfranchised. I think now is the time for cooperatives to to really take hold and grow. I had a lady on from Cabot Creamery. Mm-hmm. Cabot, most people know Cabot Melissa. Cheese, uh, McDonald. Oh, okay. Right. And uh, I told her my view of it is that people that have money don't want people that don't have money to know about co-ops. Mm-hmm. And she said I had a sinister view, and I said that may be a sinister view, but that's being uh, growing up black in America, there's a lot of sinister views that have turned out to be true. Mm-hmm. But because um, she's some of the, a lot of rich people she know that loves co-ops and so forth. So I, I think maybe it could be both. But I know co-ops got branded as communists or, or socialist organizations. It's the most democratic organization you can find. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, it helps democracy. Mm-hmm. The, on the overall bigger de- democracy of, of the U.S. democracy is people in their workplace learn about democracy and so it's very much democratic but you get people as we talked about with amar you get people everyday people that spread the wealth Mm -hmm. that gets the wealth and not the people that have money who already wants to create more and more wealth Mm so i mean i'll just talk about that key piece that you talked about them you know it's a democratic organization and that's a small d Right. I mean, we're talking about not talking about partisan Republican Democrat. No. We're talking about one person, one, one vote. vote. And that is, you know, that is the, one of the fundamental things about cooperatives is that if you're part of that cooperative, the most important thing is that you're a person and you get a vote on who's going to be on the board on some of the key big strategic decisions. You get a vote. Everybody else, no matter how much money they have in the cooperative, how much business they do with the cooperative, you get the same vote. One vote. So that's I mean, that's democracy. In, in a business organization like like you don't see anyplace else, and that, that's a that's a key element. I've had other people say that's a small D, but I think that's the big D. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because you get people with informed, they have to have informed, they have to have the information so they can make an informed decision, mm-hmm. uh, and, and they transfer that over to the, the whole community. 30 seconds, do you have any other comment to tell people? No, just, well, to thank you and the National Cooperative Bank for, for having this program and and not the program today, but just making sure that this information is shared. It's your contact information? Yes. uh, Yeah, my contact, Doug O'Brien, and that's uh, Doug.O-apostrophe, B-R-I-E-N, at O-S-E-C-O-S-E-C dot U-S-D-A dot G-O-V. I would love to hear from people. It's long. I apologize. I'm I'm with the federal government. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, Doug, for being on. Thank you a lot for all of the information you share today. And thank everybody for listening. And we'll be back next Thursday with Everything Cooperative. Have a great week. Thank you very much.
1450 WOL.